From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus with Paul Salem. Welcome to Middle East Focus. Uh, This week we'll be looking at fast-moving diplomatic events relating to southern Syria, reports of talks between uh, the Israelis and the Russians, possibly the Americans and Jordanians as well, that relate to what might happen in the southeastern part uh, of Syria. And I have two uh, guests with me today uh, to explain what's going on and to uh, discuss its importance. Joining us from Bangor, Maine, is Ambassador Robert Ford, a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute and uh, the U.S.'s last ambassador to Syria. Robert, uh, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure, Paul. And with us here in the studio and uh, at MEI in Washington, D.C., my friend and colleague Charles Lister, senior fellow and head of our counterterrorism and extremism project and uh, follows Syria very closely. Charles, thanks for being with us as well. Great to be here. Robert, let me start with you. Uh, Lay it out a bit. Uh, What do we know about what's going on? There seem to be several moving parts, but it seems to be a significant set of developments. So it's a very interesting and important diplomatic dance that involves many countries. But the most important context text for our listeners to understand is that the backdrop is the possibility of a major war between Israel and Iran in Syria. Yeah, and that that had flared up uh, about a month ago now with uh, attacks between the two. So is Russia and Israel kind of responding to that risk? Exactly. And in particular, the Russians are trying to find a way forward that will reduce the risk of an Israeli attack on Iranian positions in Syria, an Israeli attack that is so harsh, that is so tough, that it would jeopardize the stability of their ally, Bashar al-Assad's government in Damascus. So what's on offer? I mean, there are two issues here. One is Obviously, uh, Israel has always been very concerned about any Iranian or Hezbollah or other allied proxy forces close to the Golan. That's an issue. But then there's the issue, which is uh, Iranian, whatever, missile systems or factories that are elsewhere in Syria and not close to the Golan. Are those two different things? I think were you to ask the Israelis, they would say that they are all part of one big problem. It appears that the Russian diplomacy is aimed at finding a solution to this piece by piece or step by step, beginning with resolving the immediate risk of confrontation in the southwest corner of Syria, where Iranian-backed militias are within five kilometers in some places of the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. Uh huh. Well, Charles, let me turn to you and take us a little bit to the geography there. I mean, is this the area of Kunaitra that we're talking about, or further, you know, into Dera? What's the what's the geography that we're talking about here? Well, I mean, broadly speaking, we're looking at all of southern Syria in terms of the complete dynamic. What's being proposed right now or threatened is a regime or pro-regime military offensive south from Damascus into southern Syria. Now, the question is, you know, in what direction does that offensive go? The government or the regime in Damascus has made it very clear they want to reopen the trade route with Jordan, which goes through the Nasib crossing, which is pretty much right in the center of of southern Syria's border with Jordan. And that's a big, that's part of a concern with Jordan, which is something we haven't yet talked about. We'll get but to that. When it yes. comes to the Israelis, we're talking about predominantly Kunaitra governorate, which is in the southwest of the country, um, and a pocket of Dera as well, which borders along or gets close alongside uh, and, the and Golan Dera Heights. And is where the uprising began in the first place. So right. a very significant area. Abs- absolutely. And, it, and it's been the most significant area in terms of sustained U.S. support and leverage on the ground, which is obviously why the U.S. has found itself more involved in first negotiating the de-escalation agreement with Russia and Jordan and Israel in the southwest, and now finding itself in some kind of quiet role behind the scenes in trying to negotiate what happens next. And that's where we get this very messy picture of multiple strands of diplomatic talks going on, some in secret, some in the open, some in the media, Mm -hmm. um, between multiple different governments and the opposition kind of stuck in the middle. 
Um, and I don't think anyone really exactly knows where this is going yet. The big question with regards to what Robert was talking about is whether and to what extent the Iranians are or are not involved in what comes next. Well, that's my question. I mean, Charles and Robert, we've, we, all three of us have been in meetings with Russian counterparts uh, in previous months and hearing from them and assessing that they don't seem to have much much leverage on the Iranians, uh, either not not much ability to, to, to leverage them or even not much of a will to do so. Uh, so maybe, Robert, let me ask you, uh, and, uh, given your experience in international diplomacy, uh, do you read this as the Iranians, you know, themselves maybe are worried about what might happen, so they've opened up a door via the Russians to work something out, or do you think the Russians actually have leverage? I think the Iranians are willing to talk, but what's most interesting, Paul, is that the Russians have not reacted against the Israeli airstrikes, repeated Israeli airstrikes and tough Israeli airstrikes, against uh, bases where the Iranians are operating in western Syria, outside of Damascus, up around uh, homes out in the desert in Palmyra. Um, the Russians haven't reacted. You know, the Russians really criticized the Americans verbally, verbally, after the American strike on Syrian targets with Britain and France right. um, in April after the chemical weapons attack that the Syrian government had launched in Duma. You notice that the Russians aren't saying much about the Israelis, by contrast. And it appears that the Israeli strikes... A, the Russians are not as vehemently opposed to them as they were, say, to the American strikes. Why would that be? Because the Israeli airstrikes are actually causing pain to the Iranians and thereby giving the Russians a certain amount of leverage because the Russians can talk to the Israelis where the Iranians cannot. Interesting. So you're saying sort of that yeah, they're standing aside, allowing this to happen, which now gives them leverage, which maybe they didn't have before. And you're the saying the leverage is really yeah. coming from the Israeli airstrikes, mm -hmm. uh, but because the Russians aren't reacting, the Russians are not using their surface-to-air missile systems to defend the Iranians. There must be some very interesting conversations huh. yeah. going on right now between the Russians and the Iranians. Um, but it is very clear that Putin is playing hardball. And since he's not trying to stop the Israelis, um, the Iranians thereby are in a position where they're suffering and they can't do much about it and they need Russian help. Uh, Charles, thoughts on that yeah. uh, triangle there? I agree with what Robert says, but I think there's a fine line here too. Uh, and the Russians have you know, said to us in public, it's no secret, that um, they have a, a kind of unspoken agreement with the Israelis. They understand that the Israelis are going to do these kind of strikes. They're going to happen because everyone knows what the Iranians have established and what, what they seek to establish on the ground in Syria. But the fine line is, if Israel goes so far, that could potentially start to impede on the broader pro-Assad um, stance, posture, and effort on the ground. And that that could potentially be where we start to see more difficulties behind the scenes. There was a period of time that I was aware of three or four weeks ago, whereby senior Israeli officials, some of whom I met here in Washington, were starting to make it clear for the first time ever that they didn't see Russia as a viable partner in containing Iran's expansion mm. in Syria. It there didn't was, seem to be doing it. There was a period yeah. of time of real tension, which I don't think had ever really emerged before in that Israeli-Russian relationship vis-a-vis -vis Syria. And I think that might now be, you know, that might have been some, a glimmer that I saw that was probably much more obvious behind the scenes that is now being seen in public in terms of Russia playing a much more proactive role in trying to minimize the potential for further escalation on the ground. Well, let's get to these areas in the south, south, south and southwest. Uh, Charles, uh, walk us through, if this were to happen, you know, the regime has been preparing a movement towards these areas, if, let's say, Israel and Russia agree that there wouldn't be, you know, and that it would be okay with Israel if if Iranians weren't part of it, maybe talk a little bit about kind of the Jordanian aspect of this, who probably would maybe welcome it as well. But what does that look like? I mean, you know, the regime took Aleppo a while ago and then took other parts. Now, we just have Idlib, effectively, and 
and the and the south, uh, and the area that Turkey controls in the U.S. But uh, what might this look like if it goes forward? Well, I think the the reality is that the opposition in southern Syria have basically been strangled from any kind of major support across the Jordanian border for a long time now. Mm -hmm. So we're hearing some pretty boisterous rhetoric from some of these groups in the south about, you know, we've pre made all the preparations to resist a, a regime offensive. But frankly speaking, I don't know how much they're actually capable of resisting anything that will come, especially considering the fact that, you know, the regime having cleared up Damascus in the last few weeks is now completely free to focus all of its resources um, on the south altogether all at once. Moreover, the Jordanians had always controlled very, very closely the armaments and weaponry and ammunition that were crossing its borders. And so I don't think that any of the rebel groups in the south will have much in terms of spare, you know, spare capacity for a long operation. So I think the inevitable consequence is probably what we will have seen before, which is, you know, very heavy bombardment, large ground troop movements from the regime um, and probably the Russians as well. But well, a very the... significant diplomatic set of reconciliation negotiations, which are already underway. And you're, we're already seeing indications that on a town by town and village by village level, people are suddenly coming out into the open, talking to opposition media and saying, now is the time to be open towards reconciliation with the regime, which means surrender. Mm -hmm. But that is, is a result of those dire consequences that I just right. described. But in terms of ground offensives, I mean, the past offensives of the last two, three years, uh, Iranian, you know, proxies, Hezbollah, and you know, Pakistani and Afghan militias, and and Iraqis and Iranian commanders have really been a big part of the ground operations, with the Russians doing it from the air. Uh, how do you think the regime could do it without those? ground forces, would they just have to pull everybody from other areas? Well, Do you think they could swing it? This is the big test. Well, East Ghouta was a major military operation which involved, as far as I'm aware, virtually zero Iranian-backed militias. Mm -hmm. That was the first major Russian-led Syrian operation. And ultimately, it was successful. It was horrifically brutal, but ultimately, the regime won. And I think that was Russia's test case for a way that they might be able to pursue uh -huh. a southern strategy. That plus a much stronger foundation of these quote-unquote reconciliation negotiations, which undermine the ability of, of the opposition society-wide to resist in the first place. Um, but the big question, obviously, as your question implies, is will the Iranians have any role whatsoever? And that, I think, is the key point at which the US has tried to insert itself into these negotiations, more so with Jordan than with Israel. Yeah. Um, and my understanding is that the US has put forward a proposal both to Jordan and Russia that the regime be allowed to pursue an offensive in the south on the strict condition that Iranian and Syrian forces are prohibited from being 25 kilometers from the Jordanian border after any kind of successful victory. Iranian and, and Syrian? Syrian. That's the well, new would be on the border? Uh, Russian military police would be permitted to s conduct patrols along that kind of 20 to 25 kilometer buffer zone with Jordan. On the Israeli side, there is still a total, on uh, far as far as Israel is concerned, prohibition of any Iranian offensive involvement in operations. But mm. as Robert said earlier on, the IRGC is literally posted on multiple posts five to six and a half kilometers from the Golan Heights. So the key question is, do those positions get withdrawn as part of yeah, these broader negotiations? Be part of the negotiations. Robert, let me turn back to you and look at the maybe broader political picture that in the north of Syria, I mean, Turkey carved out an area, the U.S. with the Kurdish and Arab forces carved out an area. Uh, Ghouta is very close to the, you know, the capital and the regime. Uh, and here we're looking at sort of both Jordan possibly and Israel with maybe okay from the U.S. and support from Russia, you know, putting forward kind of a regime-led Russian support initiative. Is this a way in a, maybe that Assad is kind of coming back through the, through the back door, as it were? Do you think this will have political consequences? Well, it's the latest in uh, the Syrian government's generally successful effort, bit by bit, to consolidate control over parts of the country that had been controlled by the Syrian opposition. And uh, for the first time, really, since 2012, the Syrian government now controls all of the Damascus region, all of the capital regions, mm -hmm. the first time 
in six years that it has done that. Um, where we can sort of see this going, Paul, I think, is that uh, there's probably going to be some some kind of diplomatic deal that allows for formal Syrian government control of uh, these towns in the southwest corner of Syria, that the border crossing between Jordan and Syria near the city of Dara, it's just outside the city of Dara, um, that border crossing will reopen under the control of some entity that is not the opposition rebels. Mm -hmm. At that point, then, Assad really only has two opposition pockets to deal with. One is Idlib, already now with a, a serious Turkish component. Um, and the other is the American area uh, to the east of the Euphrates River, where the Americans are building up a local Syrian force, both Kurdish and Arab. And I noticed that uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, in his press conference May 27, um, in Moscow, um, uh, gave a press conference after he met the Mozambican foreign minister who was visiting Russia. Um, Lavrov specifically mentioned uh, the American presence at a place called Tenth. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask about that. Yeah, southeastern Syria, not southwestern Syria, southeastern Syria, and said uh, the Americans need to get out of that place. We can expect after this southwest Syria situation calms a bit, there will be more and more attention paid by the Russians, by the Syrian government, to this area where the Americans are located out in eastern Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, Robert, your sort of read on U.S. policy. Uh, I mean, obviously, this administration, uh, you know, is very anti-Iranian, obviously, and recently withdrew from the the nuclear deal with Iran. Secretary of State Pompeo issued a 12-point kind of declaration about Iran. This uh, diplomacy uh, has that component of wanting to push back Iran or keep Iran out of certain areas. But do you detect that the U.S. administration is sort of, you know, inclined, you know, more anti-Iranian but more tolerant of Assad, or do they still go together? That Assad is an Iranian ally, hence we're not okay with him as well. He seems to be getting through the cracks there. What's your read? I think we have to be clear. Donald Trump really does not care very much one way or the other way about Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian government. Uh, Donald Trump made very clear, both during the presidential campaign of 2016 and in statements since then, in 2017 and 2018, that he is not interested in regime change or promotion of democracy uh, in foreign states. Mm -hmm. However, Donald Trump has said, as have other American officials, including Secretary of State Pompeo, that they want to see the Iranian presence in Syria blocked and reduced, if not eliminated. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. parallels what Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, is saying. And so while I can imagine that there will be some kind of an agreement worked out through the Russians in southwestern Syria that will involve Iranian units moving back away from Israel, back away from the Jordan border a bit, um, there will still be a very big Iranian military presence in Syria. And my guess is the Americans and the Israelis are going to keep pushing on that. Um, and as Charles mentioned, um, you know, the Russians can put up with it for a while. But if they begin to sense that this uh, this pressure on the Iranians, military pressure, diplomatic pressure, whatever it is, is threatening Assad's control of Syria, then the Russians may no longer be willing to work with the Israelis so well. Mm -hmm. Charles, what's your read on the, that question of Iran and Assad regime? From this administration's point of view, you interact with a lot of them in the administration. It, depend, it depends who you talk to, which is mm -hmm. the most frustrating thing. And the core reason for that is there is no kind of guiding strategy from the president himself. So exactly as Robert said, I don't think President Donald Trump cares one bit about Syria, Assad, the opposition, anything except perhaps destroying ISIS. The fact remains, though, that the Department of Defense, the CIA, the, De the Department of State and, and his own National Security Council 
all care very intimately about certain subjects within that broader mm -hmm. Syrian scope. And depending on who you talk to, you get a slightly different range of what's the United States planning to do over the next six to 12 months. But the core consensus seems to be across the board, we shouldn't be leaving imminently. Mm -hmm. You know, even just the mission against ISIS requires us to remain in one way or another for some substantial period of time for stabilization missions. Now, when it comes to the Iranian issue, um, what you hear from people in the NSC, for example, is the pretty standard thing. Um, you know, our troops are in Syria only to fight ISIS, but we do recognize that some kind of presence in Syria is required in order for us to have any kind of leverage over the broader situation, which includes putting pressure on the Iranians. And I think that's just their way of saying, well, the ISIS threat conveniently gives us an opportunity mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. say and do a few other things elsewhere in the country. And for now, that's kind of a convenient loophole that we can continue to thread. Having said that, it doesn't give us a great deal of leverage to push back, contain, let alone destroy um, the Iranian presence in, in Syria. And ultimately, that is still the point that we're going to come to. And it's still the point we're going to come to with the Russians, which is if the White House thinks that somehow Russia is going to convince Iran to leave Syria, then we're all you no, know, treading, treading on the path. But it might be that we're in the midst of hammering out red line agreements, you know, as happened in other arenas previously, that I mean, certainly Iran is going to be in Syria right. in some way. But Israel was complaining about certain aspects of it, not the broader, not all of it. Sure. Same with Yemen and Saudi Arabia, that probably Iran is going to have influence, but lobbing missiles, you know, mm -hmm. that there you know, might be rules of the game that are being worked out in right. Syria with the Russians and maybe elsewhere. But we're, we're out of time, and I'm sure this is something that we're going to be following very closely. Maybe on the plus side, I mean, a few weeks ago, we were in, expecting, I would almost say, a massive escalation between Israel and Iran that might have triggered a wider war in the Middle East, including Lebanon and much of Syria, and maybe drawn in the Americans. We seem to be a few steps away from that, uh, and maybe that's a good thing, but this is certainly something uh, we will we will all be continuing to follow closely. Uh, Robert Ford from uh, Bangor, Maine. Ambassador Ford, thank you for being with us today. Thanks, Robert. My pleasure, Paul. Glad to be with you. And Charles, uh, thank you for being with us here in the studio and sharing your insights. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, too. And thank you uh, all for listening, uh, our listeners. And uh, as, uh, we will uh, see you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.